We need to have, we need to be as the servants of God. Let's use that liberty being a servant of God. Look at verse number 17. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear. And, and this is where the rubber meets the road. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. He makes a point of saying, look, I'm telling you, servants, be subject to your masters with all fear. Now you say, servant, master, what are you talking about? Are you talking about slaves here? No. How about if you are working for somebody, he's the boss, you're the employee, that's your master and you're the servant. What is a servant? You're serving. What is it when you go out to eat and someone comes to the table? They're called a server, right? Why? Because they're serving you. No, it doesn't. Then you don't have to be serving someone food to be a servant. And he says here, look, be subject to those. They have authority over you. They're your boss. Be subject unto them. He says, and not only to the ones that are good, not only the ones that are nice and treat you with respect and, and talk nice to you, he says, but also to the froward. That's how you act godly. That's how you live above reproach. It's not a tit for tat. Like, oh, well, he doesn't respect me, so I'm not going to respect him. That's not the attitude that God has given us as Christians. Amen. That's not the attitude that Jesus Christ had. Amen. If Jesus Christ had that attitude, we'd all go to hell. Because he suffered the contradiction of sinners against himself. He came with humility and out of love to give us a free gift to purchase our salvation that we don't deserve at all. And every single time we break any of God's commandments, we're showing God disrespect. We don't deserve his grace and mercy, but he gives it to us anyways. We ought to have a Christ-like attitude in every aspect. That's the only way we're going to be able to live above reproach. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 19, for this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, for what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. And what he's saying here is that, you know, what glory is it? You can't really glory if you're being punished, if you're buffeted for your fault. I mean, you do wrong and then you have to pay for it. And then you take it. Well, of course, you, you better take it because you did wrong. He right. said <laughs> that there's, there's no glory in that. You don't get any reward for, oh, well, I took my reward patiently. Well, you did wrong. Of course, you deserve that. That's what you should get. Right. He's saying, but when you do well, when you're doing what's right and you're not an evildoer, but you're still being punished as an evildoer, but you still take it patiently. He says, that's thankworthy. Amen. That's a godly attribute. That's a way that your actions can speak very loud and speak volumes and that's the way you can live above reproach that people say like man that guy even when he's wrongfully accused even when he's just suffering as an evildoer he still has integrity he's still able to live a godly life and show an example of how jesus would have you to live bible says in verse number 21 for even hereunto were ye called because christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. He's the perfect example. Look at how much Christ suffered for us and, and didn't look at what it says in verse number 23, or excuse me, verse 22, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Verse 23, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Now, this is not always easy to put into practice as is most of the Bible. Right? The Bible is, I think, very, by and large, easy to understand. God did not give us a list of complicated commandments that it's just, man, what is he trying to tell us here? I don't know. This is so difficult. No one can even understand. Look, it's very easy. God's list of do's and don'ts, he didn't make it complicated. You don't have to be, you know, even a theologian could figure it out. <laughs> they ought to be able to. I think most of the time they get it wrong because they reject the word of God by and large. But it's so easy. I mean, children can understand these commandments. They're not hard. The only hard thing is putting them into practice. Jesus Christ, when he was reviled, what does it mean to be reviled? I got another dictionary definition for you. It's to use abusive or scornful language against someone or something. So someone's just, just really railing on you. Someone's just bringing just, just really bad language about, against you scorning you 
The Bible says that when he was reviled, when Jesus was reviled, he didn't revile back. He didn't just go ahead and say, oh, yeah, well, you know, you're this, you're that. And when people were just, just railing on him as the son of God, he just let it be. And it's your pride that's going to cause you to feel like you just have to defend yourself and then cut the other. You, know, you cut me down. Well, I'm going to cut you down even worse. Oh, you're trying to hurt me with your words? Well, let me hurt you even worse. That is a fleshly attitude, and that is, that is not a good example of living above reproach. Look, you want to be above reproach because people are going to hear those words and be like, well, I, I heard you saying this. What makes you any better than them? You're not. But when you can be reviled and revile not again, when you can suffer and threaten not, I mean, Jesus didn't threaten when, as he was being punished wrongfully. He could have at any moment. I mean, think, who else could threaten any more than Christ did? But he didn't. He suffered it. He allowed it. He didn't revile again. 